Hey everybody, welcome to 10-ish Minutes of Truth, the ministry here at Emmaus Church where we take 10-ish minutes to wrestle with and talk about a pretty controversial topic. And man, we've been dealing with a doozy here the past couple of sessions because we've been talking specifically about gender, homosexuality, gender issues in particular. And, and today, here's what we're going to be talking about. Homosexuality and the church. Just think about that for a second. Homosexuality and the church, specifically the issue is this, beloved. What are some common questions that are often asked when it comes to, to homosexuality and, and the church? What are some common questions? So let's jump right in, okay? So, so here's a question that I've actually heard periodically. I mean, definitely more than once I've, I've heard someone ask me this question, and it's this. What should I do if a homosexual couple begins to attend my church? What, what should I do if a homosexual couple begins to attend my church? And, and I would answer that question by asking a different question. And the different question would be this. How would you respond if a straight couple started to visit your church? But, but because, because just, you know, like however you would respond then is, is really how you should respond if a homosexual couple comes to your church. You'd be thrilled, right? You'd be thrilled. I mean, I mean they walk in the lobby and, and you welcome them. You probably shake their hand. You probably may, maybe invite them even to a meal to get to know them. You'd be thrilled about the fact that there are some new people up in your church ready to encounter Christian fellowship, see what it's all about, and hopefully like hear the gospel. That's awesome, right? I mean, I mean, I mean here's, what's, here's what's weird. So, somehow we... We, we sort of get this goofy sense that, uh, that that if a gay couple walks into the church lobby, immediately the first thing we got to do is confront them with 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 their sin, right? That they were like, oh, time out. No, we, wait, what's going on? But but think about it this way. Imagine imagine you were in the church lobby serving or your pastor or whatever, and, and you're in the church lobby and you begin to have a conversation with a couple you've never met before. They're clearly new to your church. And at some point in the conversation, it becomes clear that they're dating, right? They're boyfriend, girlfriend, but they're also living together. Would you lead out with that junk? Right? Would that be the first thing that you confront? Would you immediately go, whoa, time out, cohabitation, ah, ooh, right? No, totally not, man. See, see, the point is this. The point is this, beloved. Get this. People need to know who Jesus is before being confronted with what Jesus requires. Now, now please don't miss it. People need to know who Jesus is, that Jesus is a son of God, that he came on a mission to save sinners, that he really, really loves sinners, that he adores sinners and he pursues them all the way to a cross, and that he's given everything so that we could be saved from sin and forgiven of our sin and free from our sin. People need to know who Jesus is. There's awesome things about Jesus before they're confronted with what Jesus requires. And sometimes one of the mistakes we can make is, man, I meet somebody who clearly like doesn't know Christ, but the first thing I do is confront them with all the stuff that Jesus requires without first introducing them to the risen Savior himself. So, so that's the first thing. The, the, the second question that's, that's asked often is this. Can't Christians just agree to disagree on this issue of homosexuality? I mean, come on, man. Can't we just... Can't we just agree to disagree? Because, because I you know, went to a different church, and, and they were clearly fine with it. Matter of fact, they, they said it wasn't a sin, and, and, and they were totally fine, and they're Christians, and they love Jesus, and, and they're fine with homosexuality. So can't we just, at the end of the day, can't we just agree to disagree on this issue? Because, by the way, I was reading in Romans chapter 14. In Romans chapter 14, the Apostle Paul talks about this idea of disputable matters, right? Disputable matters. And this it's this idea that, man, there are certain things that are secondary issues, all right, that, that Christians can sort of disagree on, but we can still be in fellowship together as Christians, and we still be Christians, right? Because they're just secondary issues. So can't we just agree to disagree on this issue? Well, here's the problem with that. Paul also clearly argues in the scriptures elsewhere that there are other issues that are just non-negotiable. There's, there's sort of closed-handed issues, right? We don't hold them in the open hand. We hold them in the closed hand. We hold on really tightly because they have, they're gospel issues. To disagree with these issues is to disagree with God himself. And so the question becomes this, family. Is this issue of homosexuality a gospel issue that, that belongs in the closed hand? It's non-negotiable. Is this a gospel issue? Well, well there are at least two verses in the Bible that indicate that it, in fact, is. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 is the first one. It says this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. And so follow what this means. We're told here, clearly, that homosexuality, that like living a homosexual lifestyle where you experience no conviction whatsoever, you're just freely practicing a homosexual lifestyle and living that way, is an indicator that someone doesn't know Christ. It's an indicator that someone is on a path to destruction. Additionally, and this is a sobering one, especially for me as a pastor, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20, Jesus is, he's calling out some churches in, at the beginning of Revelation for some things they've been unfaithful in, for some things they haven't really necessarily done according to his will and his purposes. And, and in Revelation 2, he's speaking to the church at Thyatira in these verses. And listen to what Jesus says to the church at Thyatira. He says, but I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Pay attention to what Jesus is doing there. He is specifically calling out Bible teachers, like calling out ministry leaders who are teaching people in such a way that it's leading them into unrepentant sexual immorality. You see it? He's calling out teachers who are teaching people that this sexual immorality isn't a big deal. God's okay with it. It's just the way God made you, so have fun. That's who God's calling out there. So, so, so when we say, man, can't we just agree to disagree on this issue of homosexuality? The answer is totally not. We can't agree to disagree on this issue because it's a non-negotiable issue. It's an issue that's a gospel issue, meaning to, to, to deny that homosexuality is a sin is to totally disagree with God himself. And then the third question that's sometimes asked is, is this, when it comes to homosexuality in the church, isn't the Christian view of sexuality dangerous and harmful? I mean, isn't it, isn't it dangerous and harmful? So, so, so one common argument is that when it comes to this issue of sexuality and marriage, uh, when it comes to this issue in the church, when it comes to the Christian view of this stuff, it, it actually does a lot of harm. Because essentially what the Christian view of sexuality and marriage does, according to some, is it suppresses people's sexuality. Like it suppresses someone's sexual identity. Like who are you to tell people who they can't be with? Right? Who are you to tell people, don't be who you are. Don't be who you identify as. There's actually a guy named Dan Savage, Dan, Sa Dan Savage, who wrote a book. And it's, it's, he, he obviously has some issues with the Christian view of, of sexuality and, and marriage. And he, and he takes it to task and he actually levels a pretty, I mean, shots fired, bold accusation. He, he says this in, in his book. He says, the dehumanizing bigotry set forth from the lips of faithful Christians Give your straight children a license to verbally abuse, humiliate, and condemn the gay children they encounter at school. They fill your gay children with suicidal despair. And you have the nerve to ask me to be more careful with my words. Wow. I mean, I mean that's a serious charge, man. So, so the question is, like, what's a Christian to do with a charge like that? Like, what do we do with that? I want, to, I want to speak from a pastoral angle for a second, and I just want to say this. To, to, to what Dan Savage says there, the reality is the fact that anybody is tormented over their sexual identity or, or greatly confused about their sexual identity, and especially to the point where they're experiencing, as he calls it, suicidal despair, that, that is indeed true, and that should break the hearts of Christians more than anybody else. It should break the hearts of Christians that there are people struggling so much with the way that God made them to the degree that when to take their own life, I mean, that's, that's horrible, that's heartbreaking, that is, that's, that's heavy, that's weighty, that that's, should be something that should cause us uh, great sadness. We should weep with those who weep. We, we should also recognize this too, though, that just because somebody calls themselves a Christian doesn't always mean that they're a Christian. And when someone who is a Christian or does name the name of Jesus and does claim to be a follower of Jesus is saying hateful, derogatory, horrific things in order to harm or bully someone who's struggling in this area, that is in no way Christian behavior. That is a, in, direct, in, in direct opposition to everything that Jesus stands for. See, the point is this, family. 
Jesus loves people. Listen to me. Jesus loves people, and that includes homosexual people. And he loves people so much that he went to a cross to pay the penalty for our sin. And he rose again from the grave, defeating death, hell, and the devil. And anyone, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you agree that Jesus is who he is, if you, if you agree that Jesus is a son of God and the Savior to all who believe, if you agree that Jesus is right here ready to forgive you instantly when you turn from your sin and trust in him, you will be saved. But can I tell you this? Your identity is not supposed to be found in your sexuality. Your identity is supposed to be found in Jesus. We live in a culture that tells us that it is impossible, it's impossible to live a meaningful life without having sex. That is not true. That's not true. And if you don't believe me it's not true, look at Jesus. Listen, we worship a Savior who lived the most meaningful life imaginable and never had sex. Your identity is not found in who you sleep with. It's not found in your sexuality. It's supposed to be found in Jesus. So my question for you as we get ready to end is, do you love Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Do you follow Jesus? Do you pray to Jesus? Do you sing to Jesus? Do you enjoy Jesus? Do you obey Jesus? Do you long to grow closer to Jesus? Today, would you trust in Jesus as your great God and Savior? If you struggle in this area, if you struggle in the area of your gender identity, can I tell you something? Listen, God loves you. He loves you. He's crazy about you. He adores you, and He longs for a relationship with you. So I appreciate you joining us for another 10 Minutes of Truth, and we'll see you next time, beloved.